Hi, my name is Leo WT, and you have found your way to the Conversations Podcast. Conversations exist to create spiritually minded conversations about life. We desire to create safe space for dialogue and community. We desire to come together regularly and intentionally to generate conversations about life, belief, and the intersection of the two. Everyone is welcome at the conversation. All right, my friends, it is Leo WT, and I am here for this week's conversations video. If you don't know who I am, uh, I am the uh, founder and lead facilitator of Conversations, which is a spiritually minded small group where we talk about uh, life and belief and the intersection and interplay of the two. The whole point of conversations is to build safe community for intellectual and spiritual discovery uh, where everyone, absolutely everyone is involved and has a voice at the table. So that is us. We are here with a friend of mine who I'm incredibly excited to be hosting this week. And we are going to talk about some major uh, foundational issues and concepts and idea that affect our world at large. And I am going to let my special guest introduce herself. Thank you so much, Leo, for the um, intro and giving me the space to come and I don't know, talk about a bunch of stuff. My name is Dr. Philippe Talalik Palmer, um, and I live here in the town of Humphrey, which um, hopefully some of you Olean people know where we're at, um, but we're we're in, in the hills um, yes. and amongst the trees. So it's lovely. And I'm hoping that my satellite internet will be able to handle um, this hour and a half conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's always um, the question, yeah, also, right? Yeah, I have a PhD in anthropology, FYI. Um, I teach currently at Alfred State, um, like I'm an adjunct, so I teach global perspectives, um, which just is a random class that is kind of required. Um, so I, because I'm an anthropologist, I just turned it into an anthropology, um, yeah, class. Uh, well but played. we talk a lot about, yeah, we talk a lot about uh, topics that, um, that we'll be discussing um, today. So it, Hopefully, I'll try not to be so super random. Um, and yeah, <laughs> it's good. We have been prepping for this for a minute. And, uh, you know, uh, she was kind of like, hey, Leo, what should we talk about? And I was like, all of the things um, <laughs> and summarize them in an hour and a half, please. Uh, so for those of you who are watching and it may be your first time or you may just need a refresher. Um, my personal belief is that everything in life has a spiritual component to it. And when I say spiritual, I don't mean religious. Like I want you to uncouple those ideas in your head. Spiritual means things that are not tangible. And what happens in our world is there are a lot of forces that create the world that I live in and the forces that create the world I live in are going to be different than the create the forces that create my uh, my friend's world. This is going to be different than the forces that create your world. And so the reason that we come together to have conversation is to talk about those different esoteric, overarching, intangible things that influence how we experience the world, how we act in the world, how we feel the world, uh, you know, coming together with our perspective. And today we're going to get into some dope stuff. So I, I reference the idea of colonization a lot. Uh, I, I've talked about like critical race theory. We've talked about race relations. That's very much happening in our nation. Uh, it, it's a topic that is at a boiling point. And, 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 and uh, Felipe has like education and expert uh, knowledge on this matter, but also experiential knowledge on this matter. So would you mind giving us a, a bit of a breakdown of like who you are and the tapestry of who you are when it comes to like ethnicity and experience? Yes. Uh, so I um, am, I was originally born and raised in New York City um, in like what the neighborhood that is called uh, Duke Ellington Heights. So I learned that a few years ago and I was like, oh, my neighborhood has a name, which is basically just south of Harlem. Um, my mother immigrated um, where she was a refugee from uh, apartheid South Africa um in the 70s she actually first went from south africa she left at 16 i think uh she left went to england they wouldn't give her asylum um and then she came to the united states she met my dad who is a, a or who was a german sicilian guy from connecticut um uh he had weird political views not weird but uh different from his family 
Um, his family was very, um, uh, everybody has military, like they're all military people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, very patriotic. Um, and he was like the opposite of that. So he was a card carrying member of the communist party. Um, he, um, he, he was very pro-union and all that. So that's kind of the environment I grew up in. I used to go back and forth to South Africa when I was little, just because my mom wanted me to know uh, what was going on. And this is like in the um, early 80s while apartheid was still going on. So I got a, a tiny taste of that, even though my grandparents were, uh, they lived in a very rural area in um, a my family in South Africa is very, uh, it's kind of, it's a little bit complicated. They're colored. Okay. Um, that's designation that, you know, the, the, the government, um, mm-hmm. the colonial and apartheid government gave them, um, and colored mean, uh, a mixed people, right? So mixed meaning, um, African, like black African, um, South Asian and European. So, mm-hmm. Um, my family has a wide range of looking people. Um, so, uh, I'm probably the lightest, uh, of them because of my dad. Uh, let's see. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, I grew up in New York city. I would travel to South Africa. I would see the, the, the differences. Um, a lot of my, my mom got a lot of my uncles over, um, to live here in the United States. Um, and then when apartheid ended, a few of them went back um, because they wanted to help rebuild the nation. Um, let's see. So that's that. I actually went and did my dissertation research in South Africa. And my uh, topic of interest was um, how colored youth <laughs> in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, form their identity. Um, and so I looked at informal education, which is basically everything outside of like uh, educational institution. So who you hang out with, um, the music you listen to, intergenerational relationships, uh, intragenerational relationship, the uh, media you consume, like your habits, all, just all that stuff. And I looked at how... Um, youth specifically colored youth of that time um like how they form themselves um because during apartheid in south africa if you were colored and you were light skin um people would pass right they would um because it was it was an opportunistic um practice that people would use in order to get you know like the things that the white people got because everything was reserved for the white people so um So my question was now that, um, you know, like apartheid is not a thing anymore. And there were all these policies, like affirmative action policies in post-apartheid South Africa to, you know, like uplift the, those who had been previously disadvantaged um, are like dark skin colored people trying to um, pass as black. And are they trying to, um, and if they can't pass as black, are they just like reaching back to those African roots, right? Um, and so, or it's coloredness, like just disappearing as a thing. Um, and basically what I found is, uh, yeah, people are opportunistic, right? Some people do like try to pass. Um, some people did try to pass during apartheid. Some people try to pass now. Um, but coloredness is still a thing um, because of like geographies, because of familial connections, because of shared oppression. Um, So even though coloredness was a top-down identity, um, it's intergenerational and therefore, you know, people kind of take that within themselves and you can try to be Black, you know, like uh, (laughs) African Black, um, Mm -hmm. but there are given histories and culture and traditions that they have that um, kind of separate them from other ethnic groups within the country. So anyway, that's blah, blah, blah. Um, Now I'm here. (laughs) That's not (laughs) blah, blah, blah. That's so interesting. I love, so one of the things, you correct me out by the way, uh, but one of the things that I love and that I was so excited that you, I mean, I just get stoked anytime someone says yes when I email them to come on uh, conversations because I've said this every week, even if no one else watched other than me, these are the kind of conversations I want to be having. And so I'm excited about it. And from the moment I met you, um, I was kind of introduced to you as this person who was like, 
intentionally um, intersectional. And that is something that I aspire to be, right? Uh, and my, my, my narrative is it's not typical in a lot of ways, right? Because I am transgender and I identify as non-binary and I live in a biracial family, but fundamentally I'm still white. And I, I was socialized like as a white cisgendered uh, evangelical Christian in America. Like that's still a pretty privileged place. And so your experience, all of the blah, blah, blah that you just mentioned is fascinating <laughs> to me because there is so many nuances that shape us all. And frankly, I'm still unpacking nuance that shaped me because I was always just told I was white. And so I'm really excited mm -hmm. to have you here because not only do you know intellectually about intersectionality and about colonization and race, but you know it experientially. And I think if, if, it's, if it's all right, I would love for us to jump off um, with a basic definition of just like what colonization is and something that you said that really struck me, which is colonization is not a uniquely American idea. It didn't just happen here. It's a, it's a global phenomenon. So if we could kind of start with some, some just kind of background on that, I would love that. All right. So I am an ap academic at heart, even though that's not my day job. So because <laughs> of that, <laughs> I have PowerPoints at my disposal. So yes. I, what I did, and uh, if you wouldn't mind, because I really like, um, yeah, and I don't know who's watching right now. It's just you and me. It's just <laughs> so us. <that's> fun. <laughs> but um, I have, like, I like visuals. So, yeah. um, and I like quotes and all that. So I'm going to share my screen right. and do PowerPoint because I do have, um, you know, some of these questions maybe answered. And please just ask um, where you see fit. All right. So let's see if I can. I can do this uh, slideshow from the beginning. Sure. I've only done this a few times with my online classes, so. It's all right. I've oh. done it zero times with nobody. So you're already ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> yay. So I can still see you. I can see me and I can see the um, slides. So um, when I do my classes uh, I and I do my PowerPoints, I usually like to just throw up a couple of questions to consider. Um, so one question I really, really like is, uh, are humans natural or cultural beings? So mm. I'll, I'll give you a second to think about that or I, answer that. Yeah, I feel like this is such a fascinating question. Like I could probably talk about an uh, up to an hour and a half about all of these things, right? Which is why we're at an hour and a half and not an hour. But I feel like culture plays so much into who we are and what we do that people don't even realize that they're like, oh, just this is just the way it is. And I'm like, dude, if you were born even two states over, this wouldn't be the way it was. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and we can talk about um, like our human bodies natural. So yeah, kind of, but they're also very cultural, like the way we adorn ourselves, um, the, you know, the jewelry, the tattoos, the hair, not, not mm -hmm. everything about us is cultural, right? Yeah. Even the way um, like human beings are born, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, and then is race universal and what role did Christianity play in European colonialism in the Americas? I will touch on other things, um, other places, because um, that's what I do. I, I like to look at global perspective because um, for at least 400 years, um, we have been in contact with, you know, the broader uh, globe, right? 14 or it's actually 600 years, right? Um 1493 was a whole different era than 1491, right? Mm -hmm. um, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and he just blew everything apart, right? Yeah. <laughs> there became this whole mixing of things. So did you um, did on. you happen to see my meme that I posted to kind of promote tonight? It was a picture of we Christopher did. Columbus with a map behind it and said, do you even colonize, bro? I had to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I know he's he's like the villain of the world uh, in in these days, or at least in the Americas. But um, like 
there's this book called um, by Charles C. Mann, and I really recommend anyone who is into um, like global history um, and just globalism, how it started, where it started, Columbus, and just the exchange of ideas and, and things. Um, they should look at uh, Charles C. Mann's um, 1493. All right. Um, because it's an amazing book. Um, okay. It really unpacks um, just the biological exchange of um, not only human beings, but plants, animals, and how it just kind of, it, it affected not only the Americas, it affected Asia, it, it affected Africa, it affected Europe, right? It affected both places. But um, right. coming from an American perspective, you know, we only think about this. Anyway, um, let's move on to this real quick. Uh, the Nature of Race. This is a great, um, a great book just um, by Anne Morning, who, um, at least in 2016, she was a professor at NYU, but she did, um, an interesting, um, research on, um, race and how people in, or scholars and professors and students see race, um, in America. Mm -hmm. Um, she looked at different universities um, and did research um, with, I think, uh, social science students um, by or natural science students. And she had all these questions about like, what is race? Um, and for a lot of them, um, students and professors really saw race as a thing that is kind of universal and um, is both biological and um social. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we're going to look a little bit more about this. And if you need to jump in at any point, please do. 10-4. So you, yeah. sorry. Oh, you're good to go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm vibing. Okay. All right. So um, you mentioned a little bit uh, about colonization. So yeah, um, colonization was a Western European project, but it's also you have Eastern um, European colonization. You have Han Chinese colonization. You have Arab colonization. Um, so when we talk about um, colonialism or colonization, um, it's we here in the United States might think about like white people coming over and taking over the land and pushing Indians away, bringing Africans as slaves. Um, and yes, I'm not saying that it's not that, but um, I think to be more global um, in this idea, we need to understand that like, it's not only about Europeans coming over and taking over the world. Um, Han Chinese did the same thing. Um, you have right now in Africa, the Han Chinese are all across the continent, um, setting up shops and um, building roads and doing things for the um, for different African communities that were not done when um, Europeans came and first colonized, right? Because Europeans were just occupying the land and trying to get the resources out of it. So we have this an, another layer of colonialism that not many people are thinking or talking about right now, right? Because um, we here in the United States, we're just looking at the past um, colonization, right? The, that, that practice. Um, but in looking at this uh, European or Western European colonization, right, um, which was a global occupation, um, theft of culture, um, kind of theft of, of natural resources and land. Um, it also involved this process of renaming, right? And um, replacing a culture um, for the indigenous cultures, right? And moving them aside. And then framing those cultures as, you know, like violent or oversexed um, and just kind of like savage, right? Um, and the reason why they didn't have these giant, um, beautiful architectural structures like uh, Europe did was because they were not as civilized, right? Or they didn't have the same um, Christian beliefs. Um, yeah, naturally, so, if, you if you don't look like us, you can't, you can't be as good as us, basically, right? Exactly. 
but they weren't taking into consideration like, hey, the natural resources or, hey, the diseases yep. that were brought like, you know, uh, 50 years before wiped everybody out. And so the cities that were built um, were, you know, abandoned and destroyed, right? Because they were made out of different things, different um, resources. I don't know if you know anything about like the mound cities. Do you know anything about the mound cities? Oh, that sounds really, really familiar. I feel like I watched a show that mentioned it or something. Yeah. So like all across like from the east coast all into like the midwest um you have these giant um mounds um they were the natives um built these cities and then kind of like um in uh like central america or in egypt they had pyramids but instead of being made of stone they were made out of earth because they didn't have the stone and so they you know um they had the, you know, like the the high priests and the the rulers, you know, like the hierarchical people, the people at the top of the hierarchy. They had their um, their buildings. They lived up there on the mounds, and then um, the city was below them, right? Okay. Um, and so uh, this was like for and. I didn't like look, look my um, reference up for this because I wasn't really thinking about talking about it. But um, uh, yeah, for at least a thousand years before Europeans came, they had um, mounds and wow. these giant cities of uh, like millions of people. They had international trade. So um, let's see. So let's say Ohio, um, they found um, macaw feathers um, mm. and jadeite from the the central american region right so there was actually international trade if you will for and yeah ohio is pretty far away from mexico so <laughs> sure is it sure is <laughs> so um but people didn't take that into consideration and especially when europeans um like mass europeans finally started seeing the native people and when the natives had been so like dispossessed of their land and um dispossessed of their wealth and like you know their culture um and so they europeans for a lot of times they would look at the natives and say there's no way that those people that look so dispossessed and poor and you know like scraggly there's no way that those people are the descendants of the mound builders who had like all this amazing jewelry and built these giant structures. Um, if you're ever interested, I think Cahokia, which is in um, like, it's out right outside of uh, St. Louis. That is one of the main um, mounds that people talk about. Um, and yeah, it's pretty interesting. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, its base is wider than the pyramid at um, Giza in uh, Egypt. So wow. pretty big. Yeah. 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 But again, because it was made out of earth, um, it didn't really hold up to time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But, um, wild. yeah, so let's, uh, so, okay. I, I mentioned the, the mound builders and, um, you know, like trade coming from Mexico. So like Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, and, you know, trade moving all that direction. Most of this time, um, people were doing it by foot or by hoof. Right. Okay. Um, and there's this guy that I use in my classes name, uh, C Loring brace. And, um, he has this, um, this book called, uh, race is a four letter word. Mm. And, in his um, in his discussion about race, he looks at how people traveled in antiquity, and most people um, who were peasants they traveled by foot or by hoof, right? So like animals or your own two feet, right? Um, and he argues that most people could only travel about twenty five miles a day mm-hmm. um, at the you know at their um, at the most. And what this did, even if you were um, a person that, you know, like traveled for your living, when you encountered people, you would encounter them at like a gradation, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of being like, 
hey, I'm a European and I'm all of a sudden I'm traveling and I'm seeing like a, a black person, like, oh my gosh, N- you know, you would see like brown people or like tan people, right? Like you're traveling from Sweden and then like, oh, people with dark hair and then, oh, people with dark hair and tan skin. And then, oh, like, e- hey, people with dark hair and, and like light eyes and, and maybe a little bit darker skin. And then, hey, people with dark skin and dark hair and dark eye, like, wow, yeah. <laughs> but you, <laughs> The transition would be way less, you know, like, ah! <laughs> right, right, right. And, and the, what he argues is that um, when we get to like 1492, Columbus is sailing the ocean blue, right? And you have all this great technology for mar- maritime technology. <gasps> oh my gosh. Now's the time when people are just, you know, like European guys are just hanging out on a boat for like weeks and months at a time. And then all of a sudden they hit a, a landmass and they're like, holy smokes. And they encounter these people who are so different. Yeah. And they're like, well, are you even human? So we'll right. get into that in a minute. <laughs> Cause they just look so different. So, um, yeah. And so these are just a few examples of, of, you know, like people that, um, traveled, right? Um, you had Herodotus, um, 1484 to 1423. He's the father of Western history and he traveled all throughout like the old world, um, like the Mediterranean world. Um, and Mediterranean being, you know, like upper, um, upper Africa, as well as, um, you know, Greece and the middle East and what we used to call like Asia minor Mm -hmm. when I was, um, coming up in elementary school. Um, and then you, you have Marco Polo, uh, who again, like he traveled by foot and he traveled like a hell of a long way. Oops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's the little map, right? He started in Venice, Italy, and he went like Europe, relatively speaking, Europe is smaller than, um, like the Asian continent or the African mm-hmm. continent, but it's, it's still pretty big. Right. It's still pretty and serious. he went all the way. Yeah, he went all the way to Beijing and then like down south. So, um, yeah, pretty impressive. And we also have Ibn Battuta, um, a Middle Eastern scholar. Um, he only traveled 25 miles at a time and he went down into sub Saharan Africa, but in no mention of any of their writing did they talk about race as we know it today, right? Mm. Like, um, Black people are, you know, dark skin, they're African descent, and then white people are European. Like there was, that wasn't a thing, right? Right. Um, let's see. And like, again, like Egyptian, when you look at the Egyptian um, paintings, you have a wide variety of um, people, the way they looked. Um, but there was again, no mention of race, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So let's talk about the rise of Christianity a little bit. Cause we did, um, we did mention this. Um, and you would probably know more about this than I would, but yeah. Regrettably. But- hey, at least Adam and Eve are not yeah. white people in this picture. Holy crap. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I like to, you know, put people, you know, like just put things again yeah. you, you know like that's why I wanted to do my PowerPoint because I like it I'm here for it and I love maps so yeah. um they're they're great visuals so um in the Bible though you do know that you have Adam and Eve and Adam is like he was you know created out of dust um mm-hmm. and then was created out of his rib and so hence we have this paternalist or or patriarchy just starting from the get-go i mean even god is the father right um and and that's a whole nother topic but anyway which i'm sure you've (laughs) talked about um but then you also have um this idea that god gave dominion uh, god gave man dominion over all things right Mm -hmm. um and so Everything in the Garden of Eden was for man's pleasure, um, which, again, creates this hierarchy where men are at the very, very top. Well, God is at the top. Right. And then you have man and then you have uh, maybe women and then like all the other things um, down at the bottom. And a quick side story. So I did my Ph.D. at um, Indiana University in Bloomington. Right. Um, Which is 
Bloomington is, I don't know if you know where it's at, but um, just to give you some contextualization, it's two hours um, north of Kentucky, of the border of Kentucky. Okay. Um, or maybe it's two hours of uh, north of, sorry, north of uh, Louisville. Okay. Kentucky. And then it's four hours south of um, Chicago. Okay. Anyway, I uh, heard of the Creation Museum. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Funny story. Can I just interject the tiniest story here? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I was married before, uh, to, before my beautiful, lovely wife, I had to go through my own trials and tribulations. Right. Um, so I, I was, uh, uh, living as a female at that point. And I, I, all, after my lesbian wedding, um, we actually went to the creation museum and we snuck in just to be extra lesbian and evil. <laughs> uh-huh. So what did you think? Because I thought it was such a bizarre thing because Bloomington wasn't so far away. And so before we came, um, before we came and moved here, we were like, we got to go to the Creation Museum just to check it out, see what what it's like. So it was wild, man. And I grew up in that mindset and it was still wild to me. So what was wild to you about it? And then I feel well. Yeah, no, there was like, there was a whole, I I feel like for me, even from the time we entered the property, there was a sign up about like, if you disagree with these opinions, blah, 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 basically saying like, don't come if you disagree with them. And then we literally snuck in through like this gift shop. So this like hyper uh, commercialization of of like faith in general. And then I also, so I believe the creation museum is related to Ken Ham who wrote answers in Genesis. And I grew up listening to radio spots by Ken Ham saying like, dinosaurs aren't real. Creation is the only way science is evil. So it was weird for me to come to this place where that all kind of came to a head. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got to hear your stories on it. Well, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, we just went because we were curious. We paid the actually like the $35 ticket price, which right. afterwards I felt gross about because I'm like, I can't believe it. <laughs> we just paid that. <laughs> but um, so it was, it was very interesting. It was amazing, the production of it. Um, so I get the, the, the price tag of the ticket um, mm. because there's just, all this stuff um and i get like he's trying to prove that okay uh or trying to create that connection that link between science and paleontology and the bible so like hey we found dinosaurs well hey you know saint george it was mentioned in the bible the dragons and saint george you know slayed the dragons and so that's why they found dinosaur bones like (laughs) Um, so one of the things that was freaky to me was the animatronics of like Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden. Yes. And, uh, that was kind of freaky. Um, it was very like Disney world, like for, for evangelical in evangelical Christians, which was yep. interesting. Um, and then when we came to the part where, oh, at the garden of Eden, they had the dinosaurs We're like going off on this like weird little tangent, but they had the dinosaurs that were animatronics with, Uh which was interesting. Um, But when they got to Adam and Eve, which is where I was trying to get to it, I felt like they were so um, like, it was such patriarchy um, and kind of misogyny that, okay, Eve is the blame for everything because she ate the apple, but we, it was so misogynistic and, um, what was it? Not paternalistic, but uh, like the patriarchy was so strong in it. They 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 didn't want to give Eve the credit. Never for <laughs> so it was just, it was so bizarre to me. Um, the the yeah, it was just so bizarre, and it it seemed like a, a sad and kind of hateful place um, to a certain extent, and. Uh, <laughs> 
wild, yeah, man. Anyway. That's so wild. Christianity and the, the the Christianity shaped so many things. And like here we're we're talking about I, I saw a couple slides back, like you're talking about pre-Christian pagan religions, and we're talking about uh, you know, native cultures that existed before Christianity. And even, you know, there's there's this mind-blowing idea that Jesus was in Africa before the white man was, right? Like there's there's all these things, and yet Christianity, which is woven into our American narrative, would have us completely completely overlook all of those things. Did he go, did Jesus go like when, when did he go to Africa? I know like he came to the Americas based on like the Mormons, right? Yeah. Before he came. I didn't yeah. know he went to Africa. He went. <laughs> oh no, I'm just saying like before the white man colonized, you know what I mean? Like it's weird that brown people could have known Jesus before the white person like pervade that divine knowledge. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but like before Christianity, most people were pagans, right? They were, mm -hmm. or if if you want to call Satanists, because they worshipped, they were animists, they uh -huh. worshipped nature, everything had a spirit, right? Yeah. Um, and then Christianity, um, like kind of squashed that. Um, and um, let's see, what's his name? Oh, uh, Emperor Constantine. Um, <sighs> the Roman empire, he was the one who like really kind of took Christianity and, you know, spread it all over um, like the known world of that time. Right. Because he had this dream and in the dream, the symbol of, um, of Christianity appeared. And so he like started to paint um, all of his uh, soldiers. Uh, what is it? Their, um, their shields with the, um, with the Christian symbol, which, uh, they won a whole bunch. They were victorious. And so he was like, this is because we're Christian. And so, yeah. Um, and then he started, um, what, um, he started allowing Christians to practice again, um, openly because they were, you know, persecuted for a long time because Christianity for, you know, a, a few, um, couple hundred years, it was just a cult, right? Um, it was the cult of Jesus Christ. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, he really helped to like spread it because once you get like someone in power believing in this kind of fringe belief and then they start spreading it, um, other people are just going to come with the fold. Right. But in, uh, you know, the Christian religion, um, you kind of have to set all your other beliefs aside and just yep. believe in this one thing. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, during the, the rise of the Roman empire, um, like this, the you know kind of roman greco logic and philosophy started to wane and then christian beliefs and and like dogma started to rise right mm -hmm. so we don't really have that um questioning and um you know philosophical challenges we're just supposed to believe and it'll be all right <laughs> yep of course that's that's how it was right like you shouldn't be able to come into a religion and think about it you should just like boop brain shuts off trust the dude up front who might happen to be a straight white christian male police officer but they have no bias they're just giving you the truth just the bible exactly. no opinions just have faith <laughs> faith is where <laughs> it's where it's at bless the lord pass the offering plate <laughs> all right so um yeah we have like the black plague and uh we have the inquisition which i'm gonna like skip over all that <laughs> um we have all these like different people that challenge the church with you know their their beliefs and or their theories of uh um like hey the world is the or the earth is round um hey the sun revolves or the sun doesn't revolve around the earth it's actually vice versa right that that's not cool because it challenges um the belief that human beings are unique or sorry that the earth is unique mm -hmm. and that human beings are unique so um all of those people were heretics and should be killed right uh -huh. but so <laughs> to the renaissance <laughs> we have um these advances in maritime technology um and equipment which is where ah, we have um columbus or mm -hmm. christopher columbus come forward and so like i mentioned before instead of traveling um by hoof or by foot and oops not to um 
you know, overshadow oh. that. Okay, you know, like, <laughs> there were people that, yeah, sorry. There were people that traveled by, um, by ship as well. Um, but they were usually hugging the coasts, right? Mm -hmm. So for the first time in human history, um, the, the sextant and these um, maps allowed people to travel way further. We also have like, remember, yes, Christianity might have been uh, had a role, but a lot of people don't talk about the economics of these things and why, um, you know, like how important economics was uh, at driving people to go to these different places, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons that Columbus sailed the ocean blue was so that he could bypass the Arabs that were taking, you know, like that had um, the lockdown on all the trade, right? Mm -hmm. If they could bypass that middleman, then they could make way more money. They could just get to Asia, get the silks, get, you know, the gold, get whatever, and just like, you know, trade. So yeah, the 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 monarchy of um Spain were like, yeah, go ahead. If you think you can find a way, go ahead, do it. Um, <laughs> and so they um, but like I said, once you're just you know hanging out on the the sea for a while, um it takes away the um, the encounter of people at a gradation, right? All of a sudden, when you um, come upon people, they're just going to be so different. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes total sense. And so, real quick, um, I'm I feel like I'm jumping around a little bit, but that's what I do. It's and I'll, I'll make the connection. That's yeah, good. we'll make the connection. Um, so Christopher Columbus, right, and like the the Southern Europeans, they were well. Everybody was pretty much uh, like Christian and Catholic for most of the time, right? You had you had the Eastern Orthodox and the Western Orthodox, which is like another conversation, which I am not equipped to have right now. You'd probably be <laughs> you would know we'll more about that. We'll put that on that, another but... week. <laughs> we'll put that on another week. No, I think that would be a, a good conversation if you haven't had it, right? For um, sure, absolutely. Yeah. But um, like you had the Protestant um, Reformation with Martin Luther, right? Um, oh. 16th century, posted his 95 theses on the door of the Catholic Church and basically the list of complaints of like, this is why the Catholic Church is, um, uh, what is like, uh, what's the word? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, they're corrupt, right? Yep. Um, you, you know, you guys are too ornate. You focus too much on like the outward appearance of things. Um, you need to just that you, you need to just see that an individual human being can have a relationship with God, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had all these different um, Christian sects that came up. So um, Methodists, um, we'll see. Well, Protestants, right? Yeah. Lutheran. Anglican and the list goes on and on. And then we yep. get like Baptist, um, Seventh Day Adventist, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know about there's a, uh, there's a whole ton of them. And that's, I think that's part of the thing that's so confusing is like, well, why the hell do we need so many of these guys? Exactly. The snake, the snake, uh, the snake, snake handlers. Man. Classic. <laughs> Which again, so again, I'm going to go back to our experience in Indiana, our like uh, 10 year or 12 year stint in Indiana. Um, like, Joe, my husband, he had a cousin living in Kentucky, like living in a hollow in Kentucky, kind of near where they have the snake handling churches. And we went and visited him a few times and we were on a mission to go and hang out with some of these people and see them do their snake handling things. Unfortunately, we never saw it. So uh, we just have to like do it through movies, like yeah, get our yeah. experience. <laughs> and I think there was a reality um, show on the oh my snake track must find <laughs> yeah check that out um but anyway um so yeah luther um he challenged um the catholic church right because he said you know everyday human common sense um is superior to like what these rulers say so he's trying to fight the hierarchy mm -hmm. which um is important when we get to looking at science and god and the two different um 
like philosophies when it came to science um, with regard to like the Catholic Church and the Protestants. And this is important when we're talking about colonialism because um, both groups, the Catholics and the Protestants, um, like found a firm foothold here in the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they approach things very differently. Um, so um, for Protestants, you have, um, like for them, there was not necessarily a clash between science and God. Um, for them um, to study the natural world and to study science is to see God in all its creations, right? And then so when we look at like, um, the divine proportion, the golden means, and we see all these, you know, like um, the the pine cone or the sunflower seeds, how they are, they they go in this specific, ge what is it, geography? Yeah, like geography. a ge geometrical pattern, yeah. Yeah, geometry um, and the human proportions, yeah. um, that just shows like, hey, this is, it, it, there's a plan, right? Um, and so Protestants, they were looking for that plan, right? Uh -huh. They were trying to show it through science, right? Um, and but on the other hand, you have Catholics, and Catholics were like, nope, science, you can't, you can't study science because um, the human mind is is finite mm -hmm. um, and only come up with so many things, whereas God's mind is infinite, right? And so there's no way that what we're going to study as human beings is going to show God's greatness. And so there was like a little bit of conflict with it. And that's why so many, um, you know, uh, scientists during the Catholic rule were, you know, seen as heretics, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, this is just a, a nice picture of, um, by Raphael from, um, uh, that shows the school of Athens, um, which, you know, shows all the, um, he paints all the philosophers and great thinkers of the time because, you know, they were trying to, you know, um, have a rebirth of greatness for Europe, right? They're just mm -hmm. coming out of, um, in 1500, they were just coming out of like the black death and the black plague. Um, and so this is the time when they're really trying to, you know, build Europe back up because they were in a very dark place. Yeah. Um, and so we get to the enlightenment. So like 16, 1700s, we start having people kind of move away from religion a little bit. And we're looking more at science and focusing mm -hmm. on like, how can we prove, you know, that God is thing, or how can we prove that, um, like, if we're all equal and men are all, you know, good and great, um, how can we prove, um, you know, how can we prove that? How can we make society better? At least, mm -hmm. you know, like in Europe, right? Um, and when you start encountering like these other people and bringing specimens back home, and I'll talk about that in a second, mm -hmm. um, they started like, okay, how do we um, address the fact that um, there are different looking people and different types of people all over the world. Why doesn't everybody look the same? Mm -hmm. And so um, Peter Camper in the 1700s, he was really famous for comparing angles um, of, of the skulls and human bodies. Because now we're moving into, um, you know, we've been studying, um, or we, so um, what is it? Uh, what's the guy's name? I can't remember. Um, Vasilius. I think his name is Vasilius in the 1400s, if I'm not mistaken. He was the first one to like start doing anatomy and drawing the um, anatomical, um, um, uh, sorry, I think my cat is distracting me or something. It's all good. Um, <laughs> um, he was the first one to, um, Oh yeah. Start like doing illustrations of, um, the anatomy and actually publish, you know, like a book of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then you have to address, so we, we have the anatomy and then we're starting to address like, okay, why are there different looking people? Why are some people like they have pronathism? Why are some people really dark skin? Other people are light skin, you know, the different shapes of the head uh, of the skull. Why is someone's skull one group of 
people's skull, like they have a bulb here, whereas other people's, their heads are more flat. So Camper mm-hmm. um, started comparing the lines um, of, you know, skulls, but he also started comparing like um, the sculptures of, um, you know, the Greek sculptures because they're considered like the the highest of the art, at least at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the highest of figures. Um, and then he started comparing them to like the ape skulls and like, hey, what about these African skulls? And so, yeah, the more at an angle a person, you know, like at a, I don't know what the angle is called. Um, if it's more, you know, like where at the forehead and it comes out more. Is it oh, like obtuse? Person. The bit, like the greater, the more I, obtuse. Yeah, maybe it's obtuse. Yeah. Um, then that means that they are on a lower um, evolutionary scale and closer to um, apes, right? Yes, yes. And and the more kind of straight people's angles are, um, which is what, you know, like the Roman Greco kind of was, um, The that's like the higher uh, human form. And then there's a point where it gets like, if it gets more acute, I guess, um, uh-huh. then... Uh, then there's something wrong with you. But then th- that's also like we have the science of the cranium and like the different bumps in the craniology, the bumps in the head mean different things. And then you also have, um, it gets even more um, deep and complicated where you actually have people taking skulls and pouring um, like shot in it and weighing brains and like wow. the more in people's skulls that means they have a bigger capacity more cc's for their brains and then they're smarter whereas other people might have smaller heads and smaller um, cranial compartments and therefore they have smaller brains and they're not they're not as intellectually capable as those ones with the- That's <laughs> it crazy. gets so crazy yeah so insane And it's not, it's like, well, I don't know if you have like a seven foot guy, his head might just be bigger than like me as a five foot person, but intellectually we might be the same or maybe because I have a whole bunch more books, maybe I have more thoughts. I don't don't know. know. Maybe, who knows? (laughs) Who's who's the angle? like hey hey wait you have a little bit of pronathism in you because you're incognito and so (laughs) yo this is wild i didn't know so i I, i've known i've been learning like a little bit about colonization as we go and especially like in terms of how religion travels because that's what my my undergraduate degree is um is you know a christian based degree with i have a minor in the bible and my major was how to be a pastor you know what i mean but uh so i knew some of that stuff but this stuff about like the origin of race is something i've been learning about in the past like two years and this is it's mind-blowing to me um even to see like just how even common slurs like came out of this like weird um you know like you know uh older science stuff it's so crazy to me yeah so all right i'm gonna skip that because i want to let me touch a little bit on linnaeus um so you took biology in school right most of us did okay so like cannabis sativa do you know what that is oh yes (laughs) <laughs> okay, right. It's it's a plant, right? Yep. And it's a uh, the name of the genus and the species of the plant. So Carl um, Carl Linnaeus, um, he was the guy responsible for this taxonomy of all things, right? All all organic living things. Um, mm-hmm. He was a Swedish doctor. He actually specialized in um, in studying syphilis. I know okay. this random fact. About um, but he also, um, he was, he was a botanist as well. And people, you know, because you have this, um, new maritime technology, people would go, they would collect things because people like to collect things and they would bring them home. And some people, he had a lot of friends, so they would send him things. And so mm-hmm. he would look at these things. He would like put them together like, oh, this kind of looks like this. And uh, so he created the taxonomy, right? The, um, the the um, classifying system that we still use today, right? And this is in the 1700s. Um, And he wrote this book called System Natura. Um, It was in Latin, but basically he was just classifying all these things, um, plants, animals, and eventually um, 
human beings. So um, a contemporary of his time, Bonaire advocated for um, labeling human differentiation. So Linnaeus, um, he actually said, you know, like we have homo sapiens, right? Mm -hmm. But um, they just took it another level um, because you have like um, European people kind of look all the same. Asians look all the same. So he came up with this, um, like a more specific classification of Homo sapiens Europeus, Homo sapiens Asiaticus, Homo sapiens Americanus, and um, Homo sapiens Afer, right? Um, and so this is where we get those, you know, building blocks of, um, of race. Um, also just to note, uh, Linnaeus was also Protestant. And another fact about him is when he started writing um, about plants and how they reproduce, um, because he was a Protestant, he was actually, and he said, you know, like, hey, plants reproduce through sex. Um, he got a lot of flack from the church <laughs> because the church rude and they didn't want to talk about sex because that's just not something you talk about and so they were like how dare you and uh i think he was censored <laughs> because he said you know, like plants have stamens and like the bee comes and like yeah fertilizes and and plants look a certain way so that they can attract the different insects and the insects can yeah yeah anyway um so there's, there's some interesting Stuff you know, uh, here's a new joke, right? Like, you know why Christians don't want to talk about plants, right? Because it's going to lead to premarital sex, man. You got to watch out that watch out for that plant talk. It's the beginning of a slippery yeah. slope. <laughs> yeah, those stamens, man. <laughs> oh, my <All> God. Right. <laughs> um, on the note of um, specimens. So here's this thing like, yeah, people like to collect things, but here's some disturbing stuff. Let's see. Let me go that way. Um, so Moko Makai, and I kind of debated whether I would show these, um, these pictures or not. And then I was like, mm -hmm. nope, I'm going to show them because they're kind of shocking. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, Anthropology, like the the discipline I studied, was also very complicit at um, like racializing and putting people on uh, hierarchies, right? Putting human um, societies on on a hierarchy, because um, you know we, this is a these are European sciences, right? These mm. are and it, they are partly based on like let's say the the, the Bible, right? Um, and like man has dominion over all things. Um, and, um, we create God in our own image. Right. And mm -hmm. so since we're talking about Western European colonialism, um, we also did the same thing or what uh, Europeans did the same thing in creating the sciences. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so everything European was normal, right. Everything else was like hmm, something different. It was other. Um, and so they started collecting things when they went to other places. Um, and when you encounter people that, you know, are maybe living in um, like um, beehive huts that are made out of grass, because that's all the material they had around them. Um, they didn't have um, steel or they didn't have like, uh, I don't know, like uh, giant blocks to create castles. Mm -hmm. um, they're living in um, these beautifully woven, be you know, huts that look like beehives because they had lots of grass. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at that. You're just saying, oh, <laughs> you're using grass, <laughs> you loser. <laughs> we have castles back home. But anyway, um, people became obsessed with difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when Europeans went over to New Zealand, which is kind of fairly recently, like in the 19th century, um, they went to New Zealand and they encountered the Maori and Maori had um, tattoos, a lot of tattoos, a lot of facial tattoos. Um, Europeans became obsessed and they were like, oh my God, I gotta have them. <laughs> and there was this thing, there was this tradition of like cutting off your enemy's heads, right? And then kind of keeping, keeping the head. Mm -hmm. Well, Europeans were like, oh my gosh, that's cool. I want a head. And so they started um, collecting the heads and bringing them back home. Mm -hmm. um, and so what this actually did in New Zealand is, you know, like you didn't have a, a unifying, like it wasn't 
um, when Europeans first came, it's not like there was just one group of monolithic Maori. It was very ethnically, you know, it was very diverse. People might have looked very similar um, because they lived on an island, but um, they had different, you know, like little, um, they had different cultures that, you know, had a wider overarching um, traditions, but, you know, like, it's not like they were all friends and like, hey, we have this unified Maori identity. Mm -hmm. um, and so you did have like, you know, people that didn't like each other, communities that didn't like each other. So what the Europeans did is they played on that like they did, you know, everywhere. And mm -hmm. um, the different groups, the different um, like smaller Maori groups were like, what? I can get guns. And with those guns, I can take over my frenemy over there. Okay, cool. Oh, you just want a head for that? Bet I'm gonna get you a head. So what it did is it start it set off this giant war, like even more intense than like the little animosities that they might have had over like you know hunting grounds or territory. Um, and it started like people started cutting off heads left and right, whether they were tattooed or not. And then posthumously, they would like tattoo people's faces and then they would give it to the Europeans. The Europeans would take it back home. And then what they would do, <laughs> some of these European dudes, what they would do is they would collect them and put them in the museum and then put them on display. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. And so um, this, these images are from like the French museum. Um, and these are things that they used to display wow. um, and real people's heads. And so, you know, like when we started with the decolonization movement, so let's say the decolonization movement started actually in the 1960s when people started um, actually decolonizing, right? When mm. these um, like late 1950s, right? When um, Asian and African nations finally started getting their independence. Um, a, we have New Zealand, the Maori people saying, hey, we know you guys have our ancestors' heads and we want them back because you got them under, um, like when we were under duress, right? And oh, you yeah. took advantage. And so in 2002, France actually repatriated a bunch of Moko Makai um, back yeah. to the Maori. It's not like they still don't have them, but right. yeah, that's just kind of the, like craziness of these things because Europeans were going over there. They were seeing people like completely different from them. And they were like, what? You guys are cool to collect, right? Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And then real quick with Sarah Bartman, um, Sarah Bartman, she was a... Um, she was a Khoisan woman from the Cape Coast in South Africa. Um, she, so uh, the Cape are indigenous people in, um, in South Africa. They live, you know, like in that tip area of the African continent. Um, this lady, Sarah Bartman, she lived in Cape Town, which is the first, um, the first site of Southern African colonization um, in the 1600s. Um, she worked as a, um, as a domestic servant and, um, in 1810, this, uh, European guy who she worked for, this Dutch actually guy was like, Hey, you want to go to, um, Europe and get, make a lot of money. And she was like, I guess. <laughs> and so he took her on a boat, brought her to London and said, Hey, you're going to sing, you're going to dance. You're going to get to do like artsy stuff and blah, blah, blah. Um, long story short, um, she was put on display in, um, Piccadilly square, um, on the, in the circus. And basically she was dressed, um, to just display her body because, you know, she had like, a, um, a big butt, let's say, and you can see it in the picture. She had a big, a uh, big bum. And she also had like her genitals were a little bit different. Um, and so they, um, like basically her labia, um, her, her labia were larger than European ladies labia. And so people found that out and they started putting her on display. She was made to, um, uh, like kind of be barbaric. Um, and, um, she basically she went to london and then she went to france again to kind of be in a circus being a freak show um she had a really unhappy life she was a alcoholic long story short she died alone um either of they say syphilis because she was a prostitute eventually um or of alcoholism and when she died her handler 
um, sold her body to these scientists um, to basically remove her uh, reproductive organs because they seemed different. And then they, pla they plaster casted her body and put it on display in the museum <laughs> oh because God. was like, that is dehumanization, right? And this yeah. is what colonialism, because I, I feel like we're run running out of time, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah. That, that's what um, colonialism and these ideas that um, like religion do, like if you don't believe in us, then you're damned. And if you're damned, then um, you're not worth uh, my speaking up for your rights, right? Mm -hmm. It's not worth me to um, respect your graves. It's not mm -hmm. worth me to respect your um, the, the, the remains of your ancestors, right? And um, we currently have these things now with uh, like, um, you know, capitalist, we live in this capitalist society and mm -hmm. we have um, development that just continues to go on and on and on in, in this nation and other nations mm -hmm. where we have, um, we're not looking at, hey, was that site a, a grave space? Right. And uh, if it was a grave space, wait, whose who's graves are there? And if it's mm -hmm. uh, like with a, if it's marked with a, a tombstone, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a cemetery and we, and they're probably Christian and we don't have, we, we want, we'll respect it. Right. Right. But, oh, there, there's no gravestone and wait, they're just natives. Oh, well, no, maybe we can subvert that and we can still just maybe move them and, and, and just, you know, continue with our development. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, we have laws on the books now to like prevent these things mm -hmm. and to repatriate um uh human remains um in this country uh we have those laws as long as they are um like if those human re remains are in um an institute that gets federal funding then those remains can have to go back but in private collections you can have you know like any of these things you can have the skeletons of people people's bodies and it doesn't necessarily apply right but um yeah again what about like in other nations where you know those they don't have those same laws as the united states and as the united states as the most powerful nation you know military um technologically and um you know like uh what's the other one military technology and you know like all different things that you know uh olympics i don't know olympic gold medals <laughs> yep. i mean we have a lot of power we need to be a little bit more um like as this beacon of you know light mm -hmm. and shine that light other places but we also need to shine that light continuously on our own practices right yeah. and stop bringing she's home and stop treating people like oh you believe a little bit different from us oh your government is different from us oh you're not a democracy well you can be killed mm -hmm. your um, what you hold uh important to you can be destroyed with mm -hmm. our bombs with our right i don't know i'm just going off on tangents and all that stuff no that's okay but, um, do you mind if we um do you mind if we chat for a few minutes we have like 15 minutes or so left but i would love to take what we've talked about here and just vibe with it on a personal level with you is that okay oh yeah that's fine okay because you start stop. you started to talk you started to hit on something there that really is um to me, like when I think of conversations, the idea is taking these big things like what is colonization and intellectually synthet synthesizing it and breaking it down and talking about how we live today. And so for the last few minutes here, I would love to talk to you about like when it comes to how you live your life and what you believe, and, and that may be a religious or moral, what you know, what, what have you, um, like for me, I can trace so much of what I was taught to believe directly back to literally that whole history we just talked about, right? Like my faith narrative and my understanding of the world is literally 
I, colonization might as well have been my religion, right? And only recently, I would say within the past 10 years, have I learned that I needed to step out of that. And then only within maybe the past five years have I learned that that had to be an action and not just an intellectual moving away from. And so I would love for you, if you can, off the top of your head, because I like to ask small piecemeal questions, just kidding. Um, as someone whose history could easily have has have been described as like history from being colonized, right? Because you have this melting pot of history in your family as a person. Like, how does that affect how you believe, uh, what you believe in, and how you see and experience the world? Oh yeah, that's such an easy question. So easy, um, like maybe two words or so. <laughs> two words. Oh man. So when, okay. Like when I was younger and I started learning about all this stuff, um, like I was like, let's say maybe let's say it's like 16. Cause at, at a certain point, like I really liked history and I liked linguistics and all that. And I liked science. I liked learning, right. I uh -huh. liked school. I was a nerd. And so I would just like take in whatever my teachers would give me. I usually had pretty good relationships with my teachers. Um, and then when I was like in high school, I guess, and I started seeing like all the unfairness, like, um, of things, I still really enjoyed learning. Um, and you know, my teachers would, you know, talk about like, oh, they would mention, I didn't know American history, like, oh, the jungle by Upton Sinclair. I was like, the jungle, what's that? And I would read it and I was like, oh my God, the workers, right? Like, what the heck? Like yeah. the abuse, capitalism, woo! And then like, you know, just the learning about the history of colonialism. I grew up during the time of the crying Indian. Like, so, um, I don't know if you know the crying Indian, but he was, so. uh, oh, um, What's his name? Dave Chappelle mentions him. Okay. It was a um, back in the late seventies, early eighties, or maybe it was like mid seventies. I don't know when the commercial first appeared, but um, in the seventies, the United States uh, had a big problem with pollution, and so um, the PSAs or whatever that they would use to stop pollution was um, like, you know, uh, a, a Native American guy uh canoeing down the river and it's all pristine and it looks pretty and then um he gets to shore and all of a sudden he sees trash everywhere and he then he like a car drives by i think and like somebody throws a piece of trash and then like he has one single tear <laughs> coming coming down his eye wow. you should look it up the crying indian commercial I'm, i've got it right here um, i'm <laughs> yes. oh and so okay I'm going to bring him up with race in, in a moment, but yeah, so I really liked animals and all that. So I, you know, my family and I would watch, um, uh, like nature shows, but so you have this representation of this, like, um, Indian guy. So I, that's how I kind of became fascinated with like native Americans and like the native struggles and all that. And so then you know being a teenager and learning like uh colonialism and all this stuff and oh my gosh it's so unfair um and and race and like be, you know people would ask me because i'm from new york city i look uh a little bit different and people would be like hey you're so unique looking what are you and i'm like what the fuck? what do you mean <laughs> I'm Yo, sorry, I, I hate that question i i mean I'll, I'll circle back to it in a minute you tell me your story about the what are you question and then i'll tell you mine. Oh, yeah 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 because <laughs> i'm sure you've got it too right um but yeah, uh, and I would be like, I would get really angry and then um, I would have to, I had to learn how, I had to learn about race mm -hmm. and I had to learn the nomenclature because I was the representative, right? Like people were asking me and I would be like, okay, I'm human. And then I would have to like, okay, I'm colored. And I would purposely use the term colored because I know the contentious history of the word here. Mm -hmm. And so because I would want to challenge people because it's not like I would get this question just from white people. I would get it from Hispanic people, Latin, you know, Latinx people, um, uh, black people, you know, like because I looked kind of ambiguous and people mm -hmm. were like, what are you? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd be like, you know, you're, that's a fucked up question. I'm a human being. And then I'm, you know, start going down my line. Now I'm a little less snarky about it. Um, but I also <laughs> get that question less. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if it's because I live in the middle of nowhere, like, I mean, more so than Olean, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, just in the trees and I have a bunch of birds and I have four dogs and they never ask me. They're just like, Hey, where's my food? Right. <laughs> right. That's all they want to know. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So 
that question. Um, but let me talk about the crying Indian real quick because yeah. um, not even Indian. He's actually a Sicilian guy um, who was so embedded in um, Indian culture because he was a, you know, he was dark skinned Sicilian. If I'm not mistaken, he's from Louisiana and mm. in Louisiana, there was a lot of prejudice against Sicilian people to the, to the point where they were actually lynching them. Uh, so it's not what? like um, Americans were lynched, but anyway, um, so you had him. And so he was passing this idea of, so we talk about, um, we also, oh, I'm just like, there's so many things. So <laughs> it's easy for people to talk about trans, um, you know, transgender. Right. And, uh, but, people get all crazy if you talk about trans racialism. Oh, um, I'm, you said the word. You got to talk about it now. So he is a perfect example of trans racialism. And everybody mm -hmm. took him for, an, you know, because he was technically he's European, right? He's, um, he's a white guy uh, by the definition of, you know, like his ancestry is from Europe. But he chose, he created his identity um, as an, uh, a Native American. Um, he married a Native woman. He had Native children. And so at what point um, does he cease becoming uh, white, like this white race, and then become Indian? Mm -hmm. And is it just about him passing? And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and so let's talk about what your um, thing was. <laughs> and then okay. We can talk more. In. No, I love it. I love it. So, so people ask you, what are you all the time? Which is a question that I get all the time. Right. And I was actually at the hospital in Olean, New York for a problem completely unconnected to my genitals or reproductive system. And the doctor comes in. I, ha I had a pneumonia uh, laying in the bed. Couldn't breathe. Right. Literally couldn't breathe. And this man asks me what I am. And I'm a little slow, right? And I'm pretty naive. I'm kind of like a golden retriever in a human body. And so I was like, oh, he's a well-meaning person. He just wants to know if I have any workplace hazards, you know? And so I was like, oh, I'm a social worker. Like, that was my first answer. <laughs> oh, which oh, yay. Workplace hazards abound if you're a social worker. But yeah, he was like, I I'm a social worker, right? And then he's like, no, what are you? And I was like, oh, like, um, I'm a parent. Uh, and then he's like, well, you know, what are you with the proverbial, really obvious wink in his eye? And so I strung him on for a minute and I was like, are you asking what genitals I have? Like, are you asking what I was assigned at birth? Because there's a better way to ask that. Also, I'm not sure how my lungs are connected to my labia. You know what I mean? And I think it's so dehumanizing and insensitive and like it's reductive to ask someone, what are you? Because it, they don't ask, yeah. what are you? Because they want to know what the essence of your soul is. They ask, what are you? Because they want to quantify you and classify you. And that's why people yeah. like hate that people are non-binary. Like in America, in the English language, we can barely handle the idea of a non-gendered pronoun. Stop the presses. Mm -hmm. It's grammatically correct. <laughs> exactly. And so I just... I just hate that. I hate that categorization because it's not about if someone's asking me who I am, like who is the what's the essence of Leo? I'll vibe all day. But if you're trying to figure out my genitals, if you're trying to figure out the what the, the you know, the color of the skin of the, the people who made me is like you need yeah. to you need to rethink your privilege to be able to feel like you can access that private of an information or that personal information by just saying, what are you? Yeah, yeah craziness i've even had people like ask, ask me about some of my friends like hey what's your friend and i'm like well, what do you what do you mean <laughs> like yep, exactly I don't, I don't know. and like why are you asking me like why don't you go ask them <laughs> like grow some balls <laughs> what a good idea what a good idea <laughs> yeah. But yeah so um uh yeah just being different. Um, so like now when, um, if somebody were to ask me, you know, like I, cause I've been asked so many times, um, I have a weird name. People have constantly mispronounced it. They say it like in all bizarre ways. Um, like my dissertation advisor or like actually three out of four of them probably 
like mispronounced my name the whole time. <laughs> like our, I, I was, I did no. my degree it took 12 years to do it. And I was just like, eh, I, I, I never had that. I mean, that's part of my colonization, I guess. And my like issue with authority mm. or like my, my reverence for authority, because that's, you know, how I was grown up. You know, my mom comes from South Africa, which is a very, um, like very muchismo place still mm. it's worse way worse than the united states um and so you know like we were always taught you know call people like auntie and uncle and you know because it's a reverence for uh, you know elders and um authority and whatnot but um so yeah for all that time i never really corrected them and then like one i think it was after i had you know finished my degree um and I was hooded and all that. Um, one of my advisors like called my hey, believe, and I was like, "Oh, that sounds so weird. <laughs> like, you can just go back to the other way <laughs> because I, I've gotten so used to it that that's like my, you right. know, that's your nickname for me. <laughs> so right, just right, go right. back. <laughs> so and and this issue. So the issue of naming is really." Um, like it's an issue it's a it's a power issue too so yeah. um i used to think like uh at a certain point when when actually south africa was going through their um their transition to full democratic rule and there was all this um all this emphasis on changing names right back to the indigenous um names and i was kind of like well i guess that's cool but like but there's a lot of money involved in that, like for signs and whatnot. They have a really bad AIDS problem. They have like literacy issues. Like maybe they should, you know, think about changing that. But like the symbolism of like, how can you, you take away the importance of the symbolism of ha having indigenous names, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and right. to see like how that impacts an individual, um, yeah, it's 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 way deeper than just like a a sign on a <laughs> on the side of a road or you know like that yeah. gets to people's core of like what they are right when you yeah. ask like what are you like well mm, 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 mm. <laughs> yeah. I am this name, right this is what I call myself and then just real quick like I, I love to use this lady in my when I do my um, classes Ruth Benedict. Um, she wrote a book in 1934 called Patterns of Culture. And in that, you know, in 1934, she's talking about, you know, like the problem with anthropology, how it was. And now what we try to do is we look at we're not trying to find um, we're not trying to classify people. Right. We're just trying to find people like who they are at their base um, right. and look at their. Cultures. But everybody she argues that everybody like nobody in primitive world or like contemporary world, nobody looks at the human um, existence of everyone is like, oh, we're all just humans. Hey, we're all getting along. Every person, like every group of people, when you look at their indigenous names for themselves, it's like us and them, right? Like we're the real people mm -hmm. and all y'all are like mm -hmm. uh, these other things, right? And so with see this is the important thing to know about like to think about with colonialism as well and european colonialism so europeans they got the power they got the technology and all that right um and so they became the most powerful you know us that they were and so when they were encountering everybody else they were everybody else and they still became like we're the us right and this is the thing about the human mind and um, Emile Durkheim, the father of sociology, you know him, right? Mm -hmm. um, the father of modern day sociology, he argued that um, the human mind, every human mind, it doesn't matter how big your, your frontal lobe is or your back lobe or like, you know, your cranium versus <laughs> whatever your mandible, um, every human mind is capable as long as you know like they're in their full function right as long as they have their full capabilities mm -hmm. every human mind is capable of classifying right mm -hmm. and the first thing that human beings classify is human beings mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's always going to be us and them right for christians it was the believers and the non-believers right mm -hmm. so for like the christian empire it wasn't based on race it was based on like uh the heathens and like you know, the ones that believe. So mm -hmm. when I went to the circling back to the, uh, the creation museum, what was kind of cool about it, I guess, is that 
like there were people from all over, you know, like all these different types of Christians, like all different races, like they looked all different people from all over the geography, right, were coming there because they believed in this thing. And Mm -hmm. that's cool, like on one level. But then when you get real judgy and start saying like, oh, you, uh, because, you know, like, you have this practice of, I don't know, like um, premarital sex or whatever, or like you use, um, I don't know, whatever you, you do abortions or whatever. I don't know. You, you use the dildo. I don't know. (laughs) You're going to hell, right? You look at porn. (laughs) You're going to hell, hell. like going to hell, going, going right there. You know, um, I want to kind of wrap it up, but th- this is this is kind of the heart of why I wanted you to talk on here is because like just of who I know of you as a person and I, this conversation I feel like needs to happen, right? Like sociologically, why are humans hell bent on othering? And I, I it's, it's really interesting to me that you pointed up pointed out that that breaks or that blows out in into every culture and society. Like it's a human nature, not just a European nature. Uh, but someone on the comment feed said. Um, you know, for the colonization of lands uh, surrounding areas, the people that consider themselves, people that in those lands consider themselves better than their neighbors, you know, usually. And this was back when we were talking about Christianity. And I said, it's so interesting because that is the opposite of the words of the Bible, but it lines up with the practice of Christianity and history. And, and so like you're, like you were kind of bringing up there, like there's this weird moment of unity at these like soup or what, whatever creation museum. I'm not even giving to give any commentary, but there's some weird unity of, of like, you know, uh, ethnic identity there. But then there's still that systemic othering. And it's, I, I don't know, like, do we rage against that machine? Do we try to af- reform it? Do we abolish it? What, do, what in the hell does that mean for me on a daily basis? Like, I think that's the question that we really need to wrestle with when we talk about race and any sort of spiritual or moral belief. Uh, to be a thinking person, we have to realize these proclivities, these natural tendencies. And you can't, the thing is, like being gay, you can't fight your natural tendency. But then logically, you have to figure out what you're going to do with it, right? Um, because there, you know, there are a lot of Christians who be like, "Oh, I'm gay, but I, I'm going to be celibate now because that's what the Lord wants." Because I'm, you know, what I mean, if I don't act on it, it's fine. Uh, and then there are people who are like, "If you're gay and you're a Christian, that you can still love who you want to love." But like, it, the same idea plays out here. Like, we know that as humans, for whatever reason, we're prone to classify and to other. So, what do we do with that? How do we fight that tendency? Because even the most enlightened or woke person here is still prone to other in in some way or another we will other other like we will other social justice groups right like social justice groups will be like oh they have too many white people in that group so you know other them right and that's not that's not the whole point of this right Uh, um so i think the first Uh, the first thing is that we all need to realize that we all have biases and that we all, we all judge. That's just Mm -hmm. how the human mind is, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or whatever. I'm that's, that's not necessarily my specialty, like is the Mm -hmm. human mind, but um, because it is a sister social science, um, I have to know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so just knowing that fact that like, Um, we do categorize people. Everybody Mm -hmm. categorizes. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are. Um, But so once we have that um, Mm -hmm. and we understand and it's okay, we we make it okay for ourselves to understand that we do have biases and that the only way, because So I do this thing with my students where I get them to take the implicit associations test um, Mm -hmm. and then I have them write about it and I and I um, make it required that they take the either um, skin tone test or the race. I think it's called the race test. And basically um, what it reveals in those one of those two tests is either that you have a preference for dark skinned people, a preference for light skinned people, or no preference. Um, mm-hmm. And then they have to take another test and the other test can be like um, gender and career or like 
Asian Americans and or Asians and America, you know, do you think those that Asians are foreign or do you think they're Americans? So like mm -hmm. all these other tests, it's interesting because some of the students that get um, the it says that their bias is white people or Europeans or, you know, light skinned people they get so bent out of shape because they're like, oh my God, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I grew up to, and I'm like, hold up. It just says, you know, like it means you prefer, you know, like a certain group of people, let's unpack that. And let's think about why you might prefer white people. Maybe it's right. because your parents are your whole family's white. Maybe it's because like, that's all you've ever known. Maybe it's because the media feeds you all this information about, you know, like white people or black people or whatever people. Mm -hmm. And in order to like fight that, or in order to like, if you want to, to see um, all people as human beings, what we need to do is first of all, realize that we, it's okay to have biases and that, um, well, the only way we're going to get out of those biases and be able to treat people as human beings rather than race, right? Mm -hmm. um, because when you racialize anyone, whether it's white people or black people or yellow or red, right? What mm -hmm. you're doing is you're dehumanizing people once again, right? You're just looking at them as like, oh, you're white. And so you're this way, that way, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're black, you're this way, that way. And if you're ambiguous, then it's like, oh, but what do uh, I do with you? And, and it I goes for gender. So uncomfortable. <laughs> if you're, if you're like, you don't necessarily conform to a gender. It's like, oh my god, I can't. Uh, what do you do? Are you a woman and you cook and clean at home, or are you a man and you like go and work and like? So it, it messes with people's minds and their categories, right? Um, and also, it messes with their identities. But okay, so I, I feel like I'm just going all over the place. But once we understand the biases and if we know that a there's certain people that we're going to actually have to encounter um we either try to have positive encounters with people that are different mm -hmm. or if we are in positions um where we know that other people have biases and they're not going to admit to it um or they're not going to realize it what we do is we create those situations where um, those people that have those biases that might not be self-reflective, that they can actually have positive encounters with the people that look different and that are othered, right? Mm -hmm. Because the only way that we're going to break these barriers is if we, everybody sees each other as human beings. And so one of the things I feel like is so kind of amazing about this time that we're living in is um with regard to education because i'm an educate i'm an educator at heart mm -hmm. right um is that okay like I've, I, I've visited um a lot of schools in allegheny county they're so rural they're so little um and so like when we're talking about diversity allegheny county there's like not really any right but None. <laughs> um we have opportunities we have opportunities to like zoom in um, the diversity, mm -hmm. right? And to allow those youth to have positive interactions with people um, that look different from them, right? Which yeah. is like when I've been, um, since I've been teaching uh, like last year, right? Um, and we went online, even like my face-to-face -face classes, I've always like asked my friends like, hey, um, you're different than what they're going to encounter. Please come and speak to my my students because um, they're not getting it in their you know daily lives. Um, or I don't want to just be. I don't want to be the only voice here. There needs yeah. to be. You know, we got to share. We got to share the mic, right? Yeah. Um, if if we have that power, which is something that you're doing, and that's awesome because yeah. you're creating that space. Absolutely. And I'm yeah, it's almost like we planned that, which we didn't plan any of it. So that's kind of funny. But this is this is kind of the space I was hoping that we would end up in. And it's not that I have to like, I don't want to be prescriptive ever. Uh, I don't ever want to prescribe and I don't ever want to control the voice of the person who I'm bringing on because that's like intellectual colonization. Right. But I think that uh, what I've seen through your practice as a person and whatever you believe, however your belief system functions in here, what I've seen is, is the fruit of that. If you want to sit, talk about, you know, you use a Christian term and I see you as a person who's creating a safe space and an, a, as a person who's just embracing their own intersectionality and by doing so, 
it is an act of protest. Isn't it Audre Lorde who says my very existence is an act of protest, right? And so I have to say, you know, as you're saying, we're creating this space. I have to say thank you for being you. Um, I, we're going to have to have you on at least 20 more times to like really get deep in there because you've got so much good stuff to say. Um, I just I massively appreciate your presence here tonight. Oh, right on. It was a pleasure, Leo. It was nice talking to you. And yay. Absolutely. By the way, I think I only got through like 10 slides. So I had like <laughs> more material. Would, would you mind? Would you mind sharing the PowerPoint? Or is it like your creative property? If you don't want to share it, that's okay. But if you wanted to drop okay. it on the page, yeah, that's no. totally fine. Cool. Cool. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll message you. After. Um, I will message you afterwards to grab. Uh, there's a couple links that I want to drop, so I'll shoot you an email, but I'm just going to wrap this up for everyone else real quick. If you're watching right now, thank you so much for watching conversations. We uh, desire to come to re together regularly and intentionally to have intersectional, spiritually minded conversations about life and belief and everything in between. And it is very important for me to know that you know that everyone is welcome in the conversation. If you are interested in connecting with us further, you can go to conversationsofficial.com. If you scroll down to the bottom of the website, you'll see a link to all of our social medias. Um, we do, as of this week, we have, uh, I, I, I've made a Twitter and a TikTok where um, I'm kind of taking the idea of conversations and putting it in different packaging so you can find us on there. Also, additionally, it is very important to me that we are accessible and currently conversations is inaccessible to folks with hearing uh, difficulties. So I am trying to raise some funds to obtain transcription and captioning services for our weekly videos. If you are interested in helping in that cause, um, you can either, you can find all these links on conversationsofficial.com or you can message me, but we have a Patreon where you can contribute a small amount monthly that will help to go to the transcription service. We have a buymeacoffee.com where you can do a one-time donation. Or if you would like some fancy conversations gear, you you can go to conversationsofficial.com and check out the shop. Any proceeds from the merchandise that is sold on that page will be going towards our transcription service to meet our goal of being open postured, intersectional, and accessible. Thank you, Felipe, for coming on. You're dope. I can't wait to have you back on. Thank you, everybody who watched. And I have just one more thing to say before we log off, and that is go Bills. We'll see you guys next week. Everybody have a good night. Bye, Leo. Good night. Bye, Bye everyone. This has been the Conversations Podcast. Thank you so much for joining. If you have any questions or comments or just want to get involved, feel free to join the conversation on social media. You can find us at Conversations Official on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And please don't forget to rate, follow, and share this podcast. We're available on Anchor, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining the conversation.